Welcome to Beyond Acting. Today, we're gonna to do things a little different from usual, and we're gonna feature one of Chicago's finest projections designers, but I'll let him introduce himself. Let's meet our Zoom panel of one. My name is uh, Rashad Devante Johnson, uh, but I go by Devante. Um, I'm a video artist, as well as a uh, projection designer, and I sometimes do uh, scenic design and sound design. Awesome, well, thank you for being here, Devante. We really appreciate it. So tell us, what does it mean to you to be a projections designer? Defining myself as a projection designer, I would uh, kind of describe that job as um, integrating ephemeral media into a kind of a performance space. So whether or not you see it on a television or if you see video in the space, that is this uh, image that uh, exists outside of the physical realm, but uh, allows you to take in a lot of different pieces of information, uh, take you to different places, create an environment around the space. Um, but it's it's involving this kind of uh, video aspect that has an ephemeral element to it. Awesome, let's dig a little deeper. Tell us what your process is like as a projections designer. Let's go from the time you get an offer all the way until you finish on a project. So uh, working as a projection designer, you know, there's, uh, I think, a lot of different avenues in which uh, being brought on a project exists. Um, part of that has to do with um, kind of the newness, more or less, of how uh, it's become applicable to the uh, theater world. Um, projection has been around for a long time, but uh, right now it seems as if, uh, you know, more and more theaters are getting excited about it. So that being said, uh, the most ideal version is when I'm brought on the project, uh, I'm given a contract and um, I'm given an opportunity to speak with the director. And before everyone else gets a chance to talk as well, we, we all kind of get into this uh, group meeting to, to discuss the play. After which uh, we kind of go in our separate worlds. We do some more research. We figure out uh, what kind of things might be interesting, figure out, okay, well, this might be an element for scenic. This might be an element for projections. You kind of figure out what, what those things are in the perspective of yourself as an artist. And uh, you come back together with everyone and you bring your ideas and then you start to formulate with the director and exactly what kind of visual aesthetic and uh, kind of direction they wanna go with telling that story. After that, then it's it's kind of figuring out what, uh, what it takes to make that idea happen budgetarily. So you figure out what kind of projectors you need, what, what to, how do you interface with different disciplines, whether or not you need to consult with the lighting designer and how the space gets occupied above, what kind of surfaces do you get a chance to project onto in the spaces below with the scenic designer, what kind of ideas you're kind of rolling around with this, and you can kind of collaborate with the sound designer. And that all brings you to tech, where you take not only those kind of ideas, but you kind of propagate them into content, which uh, can be images, it can be video, um, and those things get programmed together with the lights and sound uh, to create a uh, kind of aural and visual environment that illuminates the actors, that creates a space for everyone. And once you get through the technical process, you have uh, the, the whole show up. That's one version. The other version is uh, many times projection designers get uh, asked, after almost most of that's done and you, you find yourself having to figure out how to place in projections in a space that's already been created with a light plot that's already been figured out. And you kind of finagle your way into helping out the show, figure out those last steps before tech starts. So those are kind of the two different ways projections get involved. That's quite variation in those two different approaches to the process. Does that have an impact on your involvement? What's the time frame of commitment like for a projections designer? So in terms of time frame, I think that uh, it's really interesting in the theater world in terms of scale. Um, oftentimes when you think about uh, what kind of shows you're doing, um, if you're thinking about something at the storefront level, the time frame uh, exists where the offer comes in around maybe two or three months before you get into the technical process. So all those things that I was discussing before, the, the research, the reading, the meetings, those have to be kind of compressed. So you might have certain meetings simultaneously, whether or not it's a design meeting and what's also called a production meeting where you're talking about the budgetary and technical aspects, those might even be combined in those uh, circumstances. So you'll have maybe two to three months to kind of figure out all of those components before you get into 
the tight of rehearsals. However, the larger the, the scale of the show, the, how, the bigger the budget, the, the more you get paid. Oftentimes, uh, you'll, you'll see a, a, a time frame where it could be six months to a year. In the opera world, it's two years. But um, you'll see that those kind of stages all still exist just a little bit longer. So, for example, with a um, opera, you'll, you'll find yourself you got the the contract that's all signed and then all of a sudden you're you've got like four or five months of research which is kind of amazing and then you kind of casually have conversations with the director you might hit up the uh, scenic designer uh you know a month or two later saying hey look i found this new idea and uh oftentimes that's what gives kind of the breath to these larger scale shows is that you know you have a longer period of time so um considering the scale of a production will oftentimes also give you a, an idea of how long out a uh, process will be. Once again, the scale of the show really helps define the time frame of commitment. Let's shift gears though. What's your favorite part about being a projections designer? When I think about, you know, how and why I got into the field of projection design, some of the best things that I really enjoy about being a projection designer is the fact that it uh, requires a knowledge of multiple facets of uh, production. When I went to college, Initially, I went there to be actually an actor, and um, I also did a little bit of sound design under the, the program there. So I wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to do because I had a background in photography, I had a, a background in fine arts, um, and uh, at the same time, I was also involved in a film pro, uh, film kind of uh, group in school. So I was just kind of doing all these different things. What was really fun was that the last year of school kind of culminated with me helping out a friend of mine with her thesis and she wanted video in her uh, thesis project. And that really got me excited about combining all of these elements where I did need to know about photography and I did need to know about how like how things interact with actors. And so um, thinking about it now is kind of similar where you do need to have kind of an idea of how the space looks. So there's a scenic design aspect you have to understand how lighting works. You have to understand how sound works. You even under, have to understand how costumes work because oftentimes you're filming stuff for uh, content related things. So you got your hands in all these different things. And that's really what excites me is because it, it really always keeps me um, engaged in all of the different aspects of production. Nice. And what would be the worst part about being a projections designer? I think that, uh, one of the worst parts is the fact that many people don't even understand that that's one of the components of being a projection designer. Someone will ask you, oh, um, you know, I, I want to do this thing. It's going to be really interesting. It's like, well, that actually is a scenic idea and we can help enhance that with projections, but we have to like change the scenery in order for that to happen. Uh, there's a, a whole different component. It's like, oh, well, can we uh, project on the floor? And it's like, well, totally, we can totally project on the floor, but I feel like the space is like built for uh, mostly top light and you need kind of side light to project on the floor because you're going to be competing with this lighting design. And everyone's like, what, really? And it's like, yeah, I mean, there's there's more aspects to figuring out how projections will look good because it will it, it has to be uh, augmented by the other disciplines. Because um, in the end of the day, you're just dealing with a projector and uh, the only way that's going to look good is if other things help you out. So. Makes sense. So what would be some skills that might be most beneficial to a projections designer or someone with an interest in projections design? The skills that you need in order to really uh, be engaged in projection design is just a, a kind of a, an abstract uh, view of looking at things. Um, one of the biggest uh, qualities I think that comes with projection design is that really in the end, you're taking imagery to mean something abstractly. Um, and that, uh, that perspective is going to give you a better means of not being so literal on, in, the, in the space. If, if, you, if you're on a plane, there's so many different ways for you to uh, show that you're on a plane, whether it means that you see the interior of the plane or, if you're, or even more interesting, you're looking at something. That being said, outside of the kind of abstract looking at things skill, um, the, the skill of creating content, which will involve either hand drawing skills or computer uh, skills. Um, oftentimes you're working in Adobe products, but you know, you can use any sort of uh, computer uh, software you want to. And uh, there's also a technical aspect of it, whether or not you want to get into more of the equipment side of things, if you like electronics in some way, um, computers. 
the understanding of how those pieces of equipment work together are informative of what uh, kind of interesting things you could do in the theater. Um, if you don't know that a certain piece of equipment can actually help your life and make it easier, then you're kind of devoid of that uh, opportunity. So um, there is a kind of uh, hand drawing, uh, fine art skill that's there and there's a technical side, but really above all that is just like figuring out how do you communicate your idea in a, in a space that isn't a, a real space. You are not a real object in the space. So as long as you know how to manipulate that, that's a, that's a huge skill to have. Now that we have a better idea of what the job entails, how about going the other direction and telling us what you'll never have to do? What's your favorite part about being a projections designer based on the one thing you'll never have to do? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's interesting uh, thinking about uh, uh, how, what I don't have to do as a projection designer. As I was saying before, there are a lot of things that you do have to think about. But at the same time, uh, oftentimes I think about what uh, line designers have to do and, and the, the amount of cues that uh, they oftentimes have to go through. I mean, there are shows where uh, projections do have a lot of cues, but if that's the case, lighting always still has more cues than me. I'm never gonna have more cues than lighting. So uh, I don't wanna have to be on the headset talking to 20 billion different people about cues that I have to either add or change or delete. I could just kind of sit back and listen and be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll talk to my programmer and we'll, we'll make one change at some point, but we don't have to do it like that. Uh, that's one big thing. Um, and uh, unless it's a very critical circumstance, the other thing I don't like having to deal with is whether or not I have to say sound all the time. Sound designers oftentimes have to um, yell sound because in uh, many plays you have very aggressive sound effects, whether it's a gunshot or it's a lightning strike, um, even sometimes just loud music, if it's for a transition or whatever. Um, if you're in a very silent theater and all of a sudden you have a giant sound, it's, it can be very disturbing. And especially if it's a gunshot, uh, you don't wanna scare people in thinking that someone's just broken into the theater and started doing something crazy. So uh, you need to make sure that you tell people that there's gonna be a sound effect happening and it definitely uh, adds a, a realm of calm to the space. So unless there's a, a, a situation where there's very little lighting, uh, I, I don't have to tell people that there's going to be a projection at some point. That's not going to scare anybody. But there, that, that still doesn't happen. I guess the thing is, is that compared to other disciplines, despite the, I guess you could say, difficulty to projection design, I don't have the amount of pressure of safety involved with, with myself. And people don't really even know I exist sometimes. So that, that, uh, that keeps me in the background, and I actually enjoy that. Fantastic. And as the projections designer, who on the production team is it good to work closely with? Who can really help elevate your design? In terms of uh, people who I, I feel like I, I should be really uh, close with, uh, interestingly enough, uh, my wife is a sound designer and composer. And uh, I feel like outside of any other design discipline, which, you know, I guess you could say that lighting is super important and, and I, I do highly agree. But if I were to say what takes projections to the next level, is if you're really good friends with the uh, sound designer. Uh, you can have as many ideas as you like, but if you don't have a sound that really kind of goes with it or accentuates it, no one's gonna see it because all it is is just moving stuff. But all of a sudden you add like a little ding to something or some sort of air sound goes with your projection. Now all of a sudden it looks like the most uh, interesting and creative thing ever created. So um, I think that being a, a friend with a sound designer as a projection designer is super important. And uh, to, to, as a testament to myself, I married one, so. What if somebody likes the idea of projections design but wants to try something else? What are some similar jobs that they might be interested in? Uh, I think in, in general, you think about uh, theatrical design, um, you know, uh, many designers do it out of, uh, out of the love of the craft, out of the love of telling stories. And um, when you think about what goes into being a theatrical designer in general, you're taking someone and, and you're saying, well, this person knows a lot and they're sacrificing that knowledge for the benefit of having fun for the most part. And uh, I can say the same thing for projection design. There is so much you need to know that if there was just a quantitative amount that you only wanted to know and do something else, you could totally do it. And I, I have to be honest, oftentimes I think about it 
but uh, I keep getting drawn back to the theater. But that being said, you know, uh, I work with a lot of different assistants. Those assistants come from different uh, backgrounds and, and uh, interests. So for example, if you really like editing, uh, but you know, the, that, that component is actually very important to projection design, but you could just be an editor. You could be a motion graphics designer. Um, if you're not necessarily the most technical person, those are kind of the avenues you want to go into. At the same time, if you are really interested in this idea of the technical aspects of projection mapping, getting into being um, some sort of um, architectural projection mapper with a, uh, a lighting company is definitely something that you can go down and there's a whole road of interesting stuff that uh, goes into that. Uh, the idea of, of dealing with AR and VR is another component that we all kind of experiment with. And those obviously have a lot of avenues, whether you're not, you're into gaming or, or um, uh, worlds like that. So uh, there is just so much you need to know for projection design. If you just took one little bit and went somewhere else, you could totally do it. So it's a, it's a really interesting and wild world. Let's switch it up for one of my favorite questions. Seeing that projections designer is usually an independent contractor position, what's the most bizarre or interesting thing you've got to legally skip paying taxes on? You know, I've been trying to think about this one and I'm trying to think about like, what would be the, the, the best one? Um, the one that comes to mind actually is actually for uh, a thesis project. And I don't know if it'd be like the, the coolest or the most uh, interesting, but the situation was, was that I had an idea for a, uh, making a Pepper's Ghost. And so I had bought a uh, giant, uh, what was supposed to be a plexiglass uh, piece of uh, material. And unfortunately they sent me a giant mirror. So uh, I was bound and determined. And since I basically had to put it up in one day, I also bought uh, a lot of, uh, uh, solvent uh, materials that would basically remove the silver backing. So I went out to uh, the, the paint shop and just bought uh, an assortment of materials that I think if anyone actually looked at me, they may have thought I was making a bomb. But uh, in order to get all of the material off and clean it off properly, I, I uh, bought all that and it was all deductible with the school. So that's probably the weirdest thing that I've probably purchased. <laughs> Nice. And how about your personal inspiration? Who or what inspired you to be a projections designer? I was inspired uh, initially just from uh, that last uh, project that I did in, in undergrad where I helped my friend uh, with her thesis project, where I did a lot more experimental films at the time. And um, the truth be told, because I was involved in the uh, the uh, group for filming and I was also a intern at the local uh, PBS station for about four years. I had actually initially moved to Chicago um, to work in television. The economic downturn at the time, which I, I had moved to Chicago in the end of 2009, uh, led me to instead use the time that I have to pursue something that I actually enjoyed in school, which was uh, theater and uh, specifically taking my knowledge to figure out if I wanted to do uh, projections in theater. And that was kind of the biggest thing that got me into it. Uh, I, I progressively learned more about it and um, more about the people involved in it along the way. But um, my, my thirst for it came from that first kind of initial idea. And then the pursuance of it came out of a, a almost necessity. So um, those are kind of the two components for me. And for our final question, tell us about your dream project. What show or venue or medium have you always wanted to explore as a projections designer? I would say the first uh, real kind of conscious uh, look at projection design I ever encountered was at a Lincoln Park uh, concert. And it was quite amazing where you had like basically this LED wall and you know, for the first half of the set, uh, they they just, you know, they had like some cool stuff back there. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's really cool because it was huge. But what really kicked it off was they did crawling uh, in the middle of, this, of the set. And when they did that, I, if you can remember the music video, uh, the, you know, they, they sing the song and then the, the girl's looking in the, the mirror and then the mirror cracks. Well, they had that, but it was the LED wall cracked in the middle of the song. 
and then it like split apart and then it was like hovering over them and then the shards went back and I had never seen anything like that before. And, and the, the, truly, if, if I could work on something like that, that would be quite amazing. The scale is is cool. And just the idea of just like playing with music in, this, in, in that uh, regard would be uh, so much fun. So any sort of concert, but definitely if it were some sort of rock concert where something like that was involved would be my, my dream project. That's great. Some really cool stuff all around. As we wrap up today, any final thoughts for someone considering a life as a projectionist designer? Just thinking about uh, if, if you're ever interested in any sort of design field and specifically projection design, um, you know, there's a lot of avenues to get educated for all of it. But the, to be quite honest, uh, I was inspired by the idea of it at the end of my time as a uh, undergraduate. And uh, I made the bold boot of just moving somewhere and trying to figure out more about it before I went into any sort of grad program. And I felt like the people that I've met, the lessons that I learned that isn't necessarily directly from learning projections, uh, went way further than any sort of uh, immediately going to any sort of grad program. So I think it's important to just figure out for yourself what what you want to do with the knowledge that you have, because you'd be surprised where it might take you. Awesome. That about does it. Thank you so much for being here today, Devante, to answer all of our questions. Thank you all for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks all.